publicizing yourself as an individual has become obviously a lot easier through social media. So how much of the real Noor do we really get to see through social media, right? Like, I mean, I follow you on Twitter, I follow you on Facebook. I mean, do I really know the real you or, you know, is that a different type of person? I mean, what is that? That's a really good question. Um, So I actually am a pretty private person. However, um, I never put off like a facade or like a fake version of myself. I'm like, I'm very, very myself. I just choose to like I'm different on social media than I am with my family or with my really close friends. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's also like for the outlets that you might follow me on. So like on yeah. Snapchat, you'll probably see more of like myself yeah. rather than like on Facebook. But um, but no, I think at first, like when I first started like taking on the social media thing, I felt like I had to be some type of way or like live up to some type of standard, especially as like a Muslim woman and whatever. And then I realized like, I'm not doing this for anybody else. I'm doing this for myself. I'm doing this for Allah. And so I'm going to be um, unapologetically myself. And if I'm going to, like, call somebody out, I'm going to call somebody out. If I'm going to, like, I'm not, I, it's, like, really hard for me to to mask how I'm feeling or to, like, put on some type of front. And so you're really getting a, the most authentic version of me, but not the entire. Not 100%. Yeah. Of course. But, however... I think that if you meet me in person, then you do get that. And that's, like, been the biggest thing that people have said to me, and I've noticed that. And so I'm personally working on, like, trying to portray that more on social media because I think just social media in general is so hard to keep up with. Yeah. Like, sometimes I'm just like, I don't feel like posting anything or I don't feel like saying anything, whatever, because um, I'm, I'm, like, really just trying to always be in the moment. And so it's hard trying to balance both of those, but as soon as people meet me in person, they're like, wow, like you're, way, like you're so much more cool in person. And I'm just like, what are you trying to say? Like, yeah. I suck on social yeah. I probably do suck online, but like, yeah. I'm just, it's hard. It's a hard balance, but I'm never, I'm never a version of, I'm never a like faker version of myself. Right. So then how would you say, how would you say your faith plays into what you do? I mean, obviously wear the hijab, right? That's a, that's an outward part of it that yeah. everyone gets to see. But I mean, is there anything else that we don't get to see on the back end? hundred like, percent. You know, like um, what are some things that you fight? I'm a f- super spiritual person. So like I, even when my talks aren't about Islam, at the end of the day, they're always about Tawakkul and having trust in Allah. And I try not to like say it that way all the time. Um, because a lot of times my audience isn't Muslim, but they kind of get the hint in that, like, my faith is a huge part of why I'm here. Every single thing that I've ever gone through, I've never, like, if if something bad happens to me, or I don't get, like, a job, or I don't get an opportunity that I really, really wanted, my first instinct is to say, like, then that means there was a better plan for me, or that means that there's a reason that Allah didn't give it to me. And so I've never been, and, and this whole journey has strengthened that a lot, but I've never really been one to question like why certain things have happened um, without like understanding that there is a reason. So I think the biggest part really is just like having tawakkul and having trust in Allah. And then um, me being where I am today had a lot to do with like the prayer, like praying istikhara. Like my big, my biggest break that I had was like the night before I was praying istikhara about how I really needed a job or an internship. And then literally eight hours later, I was offered it on the spot in front of 200 people. Like, it was huge. Yeah. And so after that, I just start, started seeing it over and over again how much this is, like, really an important thing. And that, like, you can't just sit there and say, oh, we'll pray to Hadar. Like, yeah, yeah, I have to work good. Like, you can't just say it. Like, you truly have to embody and believe it. And the second that you do, in my opinion, like, things just fall into to place and they work. Um, and so that's really probably the biggest thing. Like, I'm, I'm a super, super spiritual person. And um, I know that, like... I give com- like 110% credit to Allah for everything that I have right now. Um, and I know that it can all be taken away. I know that like the opportunities can be taken away or like the success or whatever. Um, but I also know that like I always continue- continuously ask for guidance. And so whatever happens is what I'm supposed to be doing. Definitely. And I think for me personally, it's when I think about the work that I do, um, I think it's embedded in our personalities, right? So when we are... For example, I could write something about real estate. I don't have to write anything about Islam in it, but because I'm a Muslim and my personality, it would be embedded in something that I write. And I think yeah. that's kind of what you were getting at, that it's, you know, our personalities, our faith, our culture is kind of embedded in the It's a part of your doing. identity. And yeah. I think that's what I struggled with a lot when I was younger, is trying to figure that out. And now I'm like, it is a part of my identity. It's not going to be a negative hindrance in the workplace or in my like social 
uh, relationships, but it's a part of who I am as a person, and that's, I think, a, a really beautiful part of Islam, is that a lot of it is more of a lifestyle than rather just like a rigid, like it's a regimen of how to practice. No, it's like how you carry yourself, how you talk to people, how you, um, like what you believe and how everything falls into place. So it, it really is the reason why I believe I'm here today. Amazing. So why don't you tell us about some of the things that you're working on currently? So I'm actually here in Dearborn um, working on the girl tour. Uh, I've collaborated with Listen Up Clothing and we've created a line called the Nor Effect, which uh, is a women empowerment clothing line that uh, half the profits go towards ending sex trafficking. And the message on the clothing is essentially a statement that you wear on your back about uh, the objectification of women and how to combat it through empowering and enlightening our girls and replacing barcodes from bodies to those on the books. Very cool, and that has uh, an incredible meaning. But I wanted to ask you, um, you know, there's so many incredible causes and you know, what you're doing is one of them. Is there a specific reason that you chose sex trafficking in particular? So I've been super, super passionate about combating sex trafficking since probably like the beginning of high school. Um, I read Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wooldown's Half the Sky, and uh, it was a book that they did while traveling around um, Asia and Southeast Asia. They had started in China, and they found out that there was this word or term for girls who were missing. And it was something that they had never really heard of, and then they looked into it, and then they found, like, how much trafficking was going on and so then they basically traveled around and found these stories of women who were trafficked and how education was really the key to kill, like to combating it. Um, so after I read about that I had like since I've been since I was about 12 I've been working with a domestic violence shelter with my family um, and I was just super passionate about like how we can help our women um, who are in situations of oppression and so trafficking was something that really just hit hard, and I realized that not a lot of people know it exists. Um, a lot of people don't know it exists in the United States. So it was something I did a lot of research in and wrote papers about and then started working with organizations. And, um, and now, because I'm a reporter, I uh, try, to, try to cover stories about it, and then um, the clothing line opportunity came about, and Listen Up Clothing's whole thing is they give 50% of their profits to charity. And I had just started um, getting involved with an organization called Project Futures, so I was like, okay, well, if we do a collaboration, then that's what it's going to be about. Wow, that's incredible, especially because it's stuck with you since such a young age. Yeah. Well, and one of the other things I wanted to ask you about, you know, I was listening to your TED Talk, and in the TED Talk, um, you had kind of mentioned that, you know, as from a young age, you used to come home and you used to sit with your mom and you used to watch Oprah exactly at 4 p.m., right? And from that, that kind of struck a tone that you wanted to be a reporter, you wanted yeah. to tell stories, right? You wanted to be able to make fe people feel comfortable. Um, how did that journey begin, right, where you had these aspirations to do that, and how has that journey changed and adapted for kind of your purpose and what you do? So I knew what I wanted to do from when I was about eight years old um, until today. Like, you can run into people from my elementary school and they'll be like, I remember when you used to say, like, this is what you wanted to do, and now you're doing it. I didn't even know what the term journalist was or what a reporter was. I just knew I wanted to tell stories and ask questions. Like I wasn't really good at sports. I wasn't really good at art. I wasn't really good at like, whatever, um, but I was really good at asking questions and telling stories. And that's what my teachers noticed about me and my parents. And so they threw me into like camps and uh, like summer activities with whether it was TV or writing or reading, whatever. And it was this huge passion I had. However, I grew up in a very uh, conservative town and no one wore hijab except like my mom. Uh, we were the only Muslims in our school, and... What town did you grow up in? La Plata, Maryland. Okay. Southern Maryland. Very cool. So, I, uh, I never, ever, ever thought I'd wear the hijab. I was super against it. I was like, there's no way. I'm, like, I hated it. I was like, this isn't going to ever happen, especially because I want to be on TV, and obviously you can't be on TV while you're wearing it, so... Um, and then I ended up moving out of that town and kind of experienced a culture shock when I moved closer to the city, to D.C., and... The culture shock really struck me because I realized so many people were, it was such a diverse community and people were kind of embracing their own identity. And I was like, well, maybe I should do that too. And I kind of impulsively put it on. And then I realized, well, if I put it on, I'm still going to do what I want to do. And if Oprah was the first of many and Lisa Ling was the first of many, then I'm going to be the first of many. And so I, um, 
right after I put it on, I ended up getting a job at a newspaper. And this was when I was about 15, 16 years old. And um, I'm really competitive and I was like, okay, well, I don't want to be behind and I wanted to get a head start um, on my, my college career in journalism because I knew it would be harder for me to get a job than the people I'd be going to school with. So um, I ended up testing into an honors program at my local college and starting college at 16 and uh, got a head start. And while I was in college, I was always, always either working for newspapers or interning at radio stations or working at the radio station. And I ended up like starting to tour as a speaker while I was in college because I was very, very vocal about what it is I wanted to do and how important it was for other people to pursue their passions. That's great. So through those internships and through those things that you've accomplished, what would you say through this journey your proudest moments or some of your biggest accomplishments are? Um, I think one of my proudest a couple really proud moments. One was uh, when I was asked to give a TED talk because that was something that was like a dream of mine and I would watch them all the time. And yeah. so um, it was an incredible experience. And then um, I quit working as a local news reporter because I just, I had bigger story ideas. I didn't really want to do water main breaks and chasing fire trucks. And um, I like, took a risk and I, I quit and I decided to take on doing a documentary on my own and I did it. And it was uh, like a hardcore investigative journalism piece and uh, really changed my life and it reinforced like, the passion that I had for storytelling. Um, so those were two, two Awesome, parts. that's very cool. So uh, one of the other things I wanted to ask you was, you know, a lot of, a lot of your fan following is young Muslims, young adults. Um, who really look up to you. And you know, those same young Muslims are a lot of the people who are victims of Islamophobia. Um, you know, I was, when I was, I think it was a couple months ago, I heard something very profound where it was, you know, a lot of people ask young people about what they want to do when they grow up, right? And the problem with that question is, is that they don't ask the kid, what problem do they want to solve? Right? And if you ask that kid that, then it's a lot easier for them to answer that question. So, I mean, how do you think that you could maybe solve, I mean, what problem do you see that you're trying to solve? And, you know, how can you help, you know, that community that maybe is suffering from that? Well, I think what I do now um, it is pretty universal. Like, my message is really universal in the sense that I um, am always talking about why it's so important to not only pursue your passion, but stay completely true to yourself and be your most authentic self while you're doing it. So for me, it was embracing my identity as an American Muslim, but for other people, it might be something different. Um, a lot of times when I'm speaking, majority of my audience isn't Muslim. Um, and it really comes down to like the science of, well, how can I completely and utterly be myself? Because we're in this community that it's so hard for people to like, have the confidence to truly be themselves and they're always struggling with the fact that there are social standards of beauty and social standards of like money and expectations and people are aspiring more to be cookie cutter carbon copies of other people rather than just being like no I'll, I'll just be myself and like figuring out what that is and the second that I did that and I realized I'm not going to give anybody any power over any of my insecurities or or how I choose to like be was the second I realized that I'm going to finally live up to my maximum potential and I will be like the best version of myself and through being the best version of myself, I will use my passions and my skill set to, to essentially like fight for the causes that pain me the most, whether that is Islamophobia, whether that is sex trafficking, whether that is bullying, whatever it might be, me essentially just choosing to, to live my life that way and it sounds like a very simple concept but we don't talk about it a lot, about truly being yourself and what that actually means. Um, and as soon as you find that best version of you, whatever problem it is that you want to solve will find like will truly be possible, and you'll actually have the potential to to get to that point that you need to get to. Okay, well, it was amazing talking to you, Thank Nora. You. Um, was there anything else you'd like to share with us? Um, I don't know. Really exciting things are coming up after we wrap up the clothing line um, with work and. Most of the stuff I can't really share right now, but okay. if you keep following along, uh, you'll see what's happening and what's popping, and inshallah, I will see whoever's watching this soon. Most definitely. Okay, thank you for coming in and spending you. time with us, Noor. Appreciate yeah. it.